Hello and welcome to the Rocky Peak Young Adults Podcast. We meet Sunday nights at 7.30 at the church at Rocky Peak. For info on upcoming events, find us on Instagram at rpyoungadults. Enjoy the message. Good evening, RPYA family. How y'all doing? Man, I feel like I haven't seen you in like a year. I know, I know, I know. I know. It's been, it, it has been a year since I've seen you guys. Um, my name is Kelly, and I'm the RPYA pastor. If this is your first time, I'm so glad you're here. We're all very glad that you're here if this is your first time. Again, this is a place where you can belong before you believe, right? You don't have to think like us to be with us. And our goal is that you leave, out, leave these doors, those two doors, the three of them, uh, more, with more Jesus than you came with. So whether you've been following Jesus for five minutes, five years, or 15 years, I was going to say 50 years, but that would be too old to be here tonight. Um, the goal is that you'll learn something and be able to apply it to your life and that uh, you'll make better decisions and hopefully live with fewer regrets. Um, we are in a series called No Place Like Home. But before we do that, I, I know that you guys went home for the holidays or you went to somebody's home for the holidays and you guys uh, enjoyed Christmas. Anybody enjoy Christmas out there? I love Christmas. Well, this year, the Christmas was really special for me because this year I got to spend the holidays with Michelle's family in Las Vegas. So I had a Christmas in Las Vegas. We found out that we're going to have a kid. And also, I got a new sweater. And so I got a new sweater. I know, it's awesome, right? It's a super dry sweater. It kind of like embossed, raised. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah, but yeah, I'm going to have a, a little uh, human. And so I'm going... Yeah, a human, human and species, right? So we, we, we found out that the species, um, you know, two weeks ago, and it's human. In fact, we have a, we have a picture of it, and I'm going to be that annoying dad that's going to show you this really fuzzy picture that doesn't really make sense. Fuzzy picture. Okay. Okay, I know you can't tell what it is. I normally can't tell when other people shove these things in my face either, so that's it. But I was really confused. At it. But there's an eye there. You see? He's got my nose. Um, next picture. So this is this is my this is how I reacted, and this is how my wife reacted when I found out. And next picture. Okay, so this is what ha happened. <clears throat> yeah, this is. So what what happened was like so basically we weren't trying, but we obviously were not not trying. I guess you know. So we like. You know, we're like, all right, you know, my wife's being weird. She's like, all she wants to eat is macaroni and cheese and, like, soda water for, like, it's the weirdest thing. And I'm like, maybe you should take one of those pregnancy tests, this thing. And she's like, all right, fine. So she takes one of these tests or two of them, and they're suspiciously positive. And I, <clears throat> I honestly don't trust those things, so I got another one, and it also was suspiciously positive. I'm like, we're calling the doctor. So we go to the doctor, and that's my face. Um... Literally, that is the moment my whole life just flashed be before my eyes. Like, it's, that's, that, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. It's just, you know, a lot of trusting in Jesus. Okay, we're good. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, so I'm going to be a dad. Man, I'm going to be a dad. Oh, yes, yeah, so I know my dog Snuffy is going to have a, have a sibling. So, um. Anyways, and you know, the reason why I share this with you is because I, I want to share life with you. And, and, you know, with life groups coming around and everybody signing up, we're just going to share life with each other. So the good times and the bad times. And so we're in like, so we're like 11 weeks pregnant. We, by she, um, is 11 weeks pregnant. And we just want to share the good times and the bad times with you guys. And so no matter what, we love you and we want you to be in our lives. And we want our little minion to run around calling you aunt and uncle all day. Right, that's minion is what I call it um, <clears throat> right now. Uh, but, you know, I want you guys to be like her, you know, her or his aunts and uncles. Um, so I just want to share that with you guys. Uh, I feel like that's an appropriate uh, way to start today's sermon uh, series called Welcome Home. And I love this place. And this is the best place that I get to be every single week. And I get to see your faces and uh, you get to suffer with this. And so I'm glad that you decided to be here. Question, what makes home feel like home? What makes home feel like home? To you, like it may be the smell of 
Centronella candles? I don't know. What, I don't know what makes home feel like home to you. Is it your bed? Is it your, your binky? I don't know. Some people probably sleep with stuffed animals. I don't know. What makes home feel like home? For me, when Michelle and I, we bought a condo, the first thing we needed to do was make this place feel like home. So you know what we did? We scraped the ceiling because we cannot have popcorn in our ceiling. That is so nasty. Popcorn ceiling. I know when, if I look up and there's popcorn ceiling, that's not my home, right? That is just not my home. It is uncomfortable. And maybe you don't know what popcorn ceiling is. It's kind of like when you walk into a cave and there's like stalagmites like falling from the ceiling. And if you were to scrape it, it would just like, it would be a snow biggie party. All right, so that's what popcorn ceiling. You know, sometimes I don't only feel at home at home. I feel at home in my car. And some of the reasons that I, the, the, some of the ways I feel home at home in my car is the, the certain things that only I do in my car, the certain things that I need to feel comfortable in my car. And one of those things that I need to feel comfortable in my car is a cushy steering wheel cover. Because I have soft and supple hands. <laughs> and, and I need something squishy to hold on to. And if it's too hot, you know, it burns my paws. And if it's too, you know, I, I just need something to hold on to other than my sticky steering wheel when it gets too hot, right? And then, and I don't, I not only feel at home in my car, I also feel at home when I'm at my desk when everything's clean. Like I can't, oh, see, I heard, I heard you guys, right? Nothing can be on the desk, right? If there's stuff on the desk, I, I just feel, at un, you know, uncomfortable. I don't feel at ease. I don't feel at home. But today, we're not talking about really what it feels like to be at home, but the reality is, is, what does it feel like to be at home on earth? Because when you look at the news, and we look, in the, we look back in 2018, we see a lot of tragedy. We see a lot of discomfort. And there's just something about this discomfort that just doesn't feel settling, doesn't it? When you look at the news, you look at finances, you see a lot of people that are dissatisfied, depressed, and distressed, and maybe even devastated. And maybe you experienced some devastation last year, or you experienced some disaster. I know we all did in Thousand Oaks. And all of that discomfort tells us something about this planet. It tells us that we are not at home. I mean, consider the fish. C.S. Lewis writes about this. It's a really phenomenal um, comparison. He's like, fish are not uncomfortable with being wet, are they? But we are uncomfortable on earth, which tells us that fish were made for the water, but we are not made for earth. So then, the question that I want to ask today well, there's three questions. The first question I want to ask today is, where is home if it's not here? Where is home if it's not here? Because the reality is, the, the reason why you feel discomfort, the reason why we experience death and disaster is because we are not meant for this version of earth. We were meant for something better, something eternal, something intimate, something that lasts. That's why we're disappointed when something doesn't last, like love. We're meant to experience a love that lasts forever, or like work that is meaningful, that goes beyond us, or beauty that never fades. So if you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, I want to take a look at what our original home was supposed to be like. I want to take a look at what home was supposed to be like. Where exactly is home? It says here in Genesis 2, home is in a garden. In a garden. Genesis 2, chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, and I'm going to skip around a little bit. If you have your Bible apps, you can open those or turn them on. Genesis 2, 8 through 9 says, Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put them, man and woman, he formed. Pause. If we can get a timer on the back, that would be awesome. 
Verse 9. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food in the middle of the garden. In the middle of the garden, there was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15, skipping down. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden to work it. Somebody say work it. And take care of it. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded them, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone, so I will make him a helper suitable for him. Adam and his wife Eve were both naked and unashamed. Yeah. So this is a picture of what home was supposed to be like. This is a picture of what home is supposed to be like. If we're asking the question, where is home? Here is a picture of home. Right, the first two chapters of the Bible and the last two chapters of the Bible. Right, and every, everything between Genesis two and Revelation twenty, we are not home yet. But chapter two says, God made this garden, and there's a lot of things that were pleasing to the eye. Right, there's a beauty that lasts forever. Right, and his job, the man's job, was to work it, work the ground, take care of it. Right, and so his. Like, we were created to create, essentially. Have work that lasts forever. We were were never meant to retire. We're never meant to literally create a legacy and then die and let somebody else take care of it. We're created to leave a legacy and watch it grow. Right? I don't care how awesome the Lion King is. They cannot make death sound normal. You know that Lion King song? I don't know the first part, but I just know that, the, you know, the whole song ends up. And then let me just summarize it for you. la di da da you die, you become, you know, worm food, right? And somebody else eats the worm, and then it's a circle of life, right? You guys get that, right? Basically, you're not meant. So basically, Lion King says you are meant to become fertilizer. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's not very satisfying, is it? Right? No matter how much. This world, no matter how much we look at the animal kingdom, because the animal kingdom, they're very satisfied. They're not worried about dying. It's us that worry about those things, not animals, because animals were made for earth. We were meant for something else, right? A life and death that turns into fertilizer is not satisfying, which tells us we were meant for more. And in, this, in the middle of this garden, God created a tree of knowledge, and good of, uh, a knowledge of good and of evil. But there's a lot of other trees in this garden. But God created a system where there's only one option where humans can mess up. And we're going to talk a little bit later by why exactly is there a tree of knowledge and good and evil. That just, I always wanted to know that. And I'm sure you've probably wondered that as well. And, and then God said to the man, you know, or God said to himself, it's not, you know, it's not good for a man, this man, to be alone. So I will make him a what? Suitable helper. Now, I know, like, all my feminists in the house are going to be like, what do you mean helper? Like, you know, this verse can be taken out of context to mean something that it really isn't. See, the word here for helper is the same word that King David uses to refer to God in Psalm 54 when David says, the Lord is my helper. And so the same word for that is the same word that we see here, whereas you have somebody who literally needs somebody else to, to, to go on. Like, we cannot live life alone. God knew that. But the interesting thing is, if you know the whole story of the, of the Genesis 2 creation, he didn't satisfy his need for loneliness right away. Maybe you're lonely and you feel like, ah, where's my helper? Um, he doesn't satisfy Adam's need. You know, what, you know what God does right after that? He has him name all the animals. 
So he takes that need and he stretches it out so that he can appreciate the great gift that God was about to give him. So anyways, Adam and his wife were both naked and ashamed. Wow, that's beautiful. See, the word naked is very different than the word nudity, right? We see the word naked and we're like, oh, nakey, nakey, right? This seems like something scandalous, right? So you, the reality is, is that they're standing in front of, ch- of each other completely naked, unashamed, completely secure. They don't have to change their appearance to feel beautiful. The word language that is being shown here is that they are able to peer into each other's eyes, peer at each other's bodies, and not feel any insecurity. Literally staring at each other. You know, it's kind of awkward. Like, if I had two people come up here and stare at each other, it won't be long until they start laughing or, like, it makes us all feel uncomfortable, right? right? They were able to stare at each other, and it wasn't uncomfortable. See, what, what I think is interesting here is that they appeared exactly how they were, and they were staring at each other, and they didn't feel the need to change their appearance at all. That's why I was attracted to my wife. It's because I wanted to marry somebody that I felt didn't need to change her appearance that much, or at all. (laughs) That much. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. High heels was the measuring stick. Because... When women wear high heels, it changes your, 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 your anatomy, essentially, right? Your hips go up, you know, your calves start to show a little, you know, definition, and your posture changes, right? And so high heels were definitely not something that I was attracted to, so I knew in my head, this is like some weird, like, you know, single man's thought, right? And I know there might be somebody else thinking this, too. But I'm like, I need a woman who's hot even in sandals. Like, like I know my wife, whoever she is, she's going to look great in Converse, right? So anyways, when I met Michelle, I was like, oh, she's pretty. And then the first thing, I looked down, wearing Converse. I'm like, yes, jackpot, right? Because I knew she didn't have to change her appearance. Now, ladies, I'm not bashing makeup. I'm not bashing, um, you know, uh, high heels, whatever. Um, even though I don't necessarily think it's good for you to wear high heels. It's bad for your posture and everything. But... Um, Google it. Um, but the idea is, in our culture, because we live in a, in a sin-tainted world, we feel like we need to change our appearance in order to feel, well, secure. This was not so in the garden. We were meant to experience a beauty that never fades, a work that never ends, and a love that lasts forever. And that's what home was like. That's what home was like. And that's what home is supposed to be like. And we get glimpses of that in a committed covenantal relationship with one another. And we, we get glimpses of that when we're truly accepted uh, for who we are in, in places like this. But we get glimmers of it, glimpses of it. But we are dissatisfied because we haven't experienced the fruition of it because we were meant to be in a garden. But instead, we are on earth, living in tents as if we were camping. And some of us think that this is our permanent residence. But it's not. How silly would it be if we went to the Angeles Forest and we were all camping, but I decided to bring a washing machine. And I decided to build a desk inside my tent. And I pretended like I was meant to live there for years, right? That tent cannot sustain a life for 80 or 60 years. It can't. It will be dissatisfying. It's not meant to satisfy the longing of the human heart, the human soul, the human soul or the human desire. We were meant for a garden. And let me tell you, if you're a skeptic here and you don't believe in God, hey, I'm glad you're here. But we don't believe this story because it's in the Bible. The reason we believe Genesis 2 is because Jesus believed it. And he prophesied his own death, burial, and resurrection and came back to life. And anybody who does that, I'm going to listen to him. So we just go with whatever he says. And he believes this, so I believe it. 
And it's also, even if, like, think about it. Even if, because Moses wrote this. So even if, like, this is written by a guy, this guy had to be completely brilliant to come up with this stuff. Completely brilliant, especially for ancient literature. No other historical ancient religion ever, ever relates to God like this. No other religion relates to God like this. Every other religion says that earth and humanity came out of the results of different gods, like finding each other and out of the carcass of a dead god, you know, spring life, right? Like all the other religions have some sort of, you know, mortifying story. But this is the only story that has a God who created humanity, ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. Only this God is powerful, to, powerful enough to speak words and life be. And you're meant to have a relationship with him. So where's home? Home is in the garden, but not because the garden is beautiful. You're not meant to just be at home in a garden without a God. See, what makes the garden so beautiful is because you are, that is an environment where you can sustain a relationship with an eternal father who created you. You know, sometimes we make excuses. You know, we, we, we blame our environment for our bad behavior or the reason why we're not progressing in life, right? The garden was just the environment to foster the type of relationship we were meant to have. Capiche? Make sense? There's this guy, John Piper. He said this. When it comes to having a relationship with God, would you still want a relationship with God even if he wasn't in heaven? Because your relationship with God was meant to surpass whatever, you know, whatever heaven could ever offer. You know, so if you're here today and the reason why you want Jesus is because you want heaven, that's like marrying somebody because you want their money, right? And so what God wants to do is call you into a deeper relationship than just, hey, I want a relationship with you just because of heaven. No, God provides heaven because it's an environment in which you will not be distracted from having an intimate relationship with him, the kind of relationship that Adam and Eve were supposed to have in the garden. Does that make sense? So where did heaven go? Where did the garden go? Let me tell you. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Now, here's a story. It's crazy. <sighs> now, the serpent, the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals that the Lord God had made. He, the serpent, said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the, oh, I'm sorry, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Pause. The serpent is usually personified as Satan in Genesis 3. And uh, for today's purposes, we'll just say that's Satan. The reason why I, I say that is because we need to understand that humans, you and me, we are spirits with a body. All right? When we die, we know that our spirit goes somewhere else, right? If I were to chop off your arms and legs, you would still be you. Right? There's something more to you than what you can do for me and what you can do for others. Right? If you lost your job, lost your abilities, you would still be you. Because there's more to you than just matter. There's more to you than just the physicalness of you. Right? The reason why you care, the reason why you're dissatisfied in this world is because you have a spirit. And there is a spiritual world. That's, that you are responding to. There is a non-physical world that you are responding to. And in this non-physical world, there are things and creatures that want you to do the opposite of what God wants. In this case, it was a serpent or Satan. And so the serpent, he was crafty and God made him, which means this, Satan is not equal to God. Right? Satan is a limited created being. Right? So he's got a limited free will. He is created by God. He is not equal. He said to the woman, did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Any tree? That's a bold-faced lie, by the way. But the way Satan tries to get you in your life, if you have a habitual sin or whatever, the, re the way it started, started exactly like this. 
It started doubting God's word. Did God really say that? Did, did he really? Did that really happen? Skeptics like to often say that Noah couldn't have possibly put all those animals on the ark. Right? The dimensions just don't fit the amount of species there are on the planet. So I reject the whole Bible. So it couldn't have happened. Right? And, and that, can, that, that like little piece of skeptic wisdom could sit in your heart. And then it could fester and turn, and to turn into something evil. But the reality is, is that if we believe that a God can create the world out of nothing, I have no problem believing that he can put some animals on a boat. All right? Because we accept miracles. Because we believe in a non-physical world. Because there's more to you than matter. And the, the beginning of, of finding your way away from home, the beginning of finding your way running away from God is doubting his word. And that's exactly what Satan does. But I like how Eve responds. Eve's a good girl right now. <coughs> the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit, from the trees, in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat from the fruit, from the tree, that is in the middle of the garden. And she adds her own little commentary. And you must not touch it or you'll die. So, the good thing that she does is she, she re refutes lies with what? The truth. That's how you're supposed to handle temptation, right? You refute lies with the truth. There might be things that you are believing about yourself. There's things that you're believing about God. There's things that you're believing about the people around you. But because you don't know the truth, you will continue to fall for these lies every single time unless your nose is in God's word. That's just the truth. Serpent responds, verse 4. You will not certainly die. P.S. Nobody knows what death means at this point. Like, we're just all talking. Like, like Adam, Eve, the serpent, nobody knows what death is. So, you know, he, he can just say whatever he wants. The serpent says, you won't die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So what Satan is doing here is he is underestimating the consequences of disobedience. Underestim underestimating the consequences of disobedience. Does that make sense? And overestimating the benefits of disobedience. He's saying, if you disobey, you'll actually be more like God. See, God is holding out on you, and it, unless you do this for yourself, you're not going to actually experience the fullness of what God wants from you, or for you. And what God says, well, he's, you know, he's just overreacting. You're not going to die. Every sinful temptation begins with doubting God's word, and underestimating the consequences of disobedience and overestimating the benefits of disobedience to God because there are no benefits to disobedience, only death and distance, disaster, destruction, or any other D word I can think of right now. Let's see how the story ends. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. Can't forget about wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her the whole time. And he ate it too. What a doofus. He stood there and watched the whole thing happen. Dang, Adam... Man, I wish we weren't related. So you notice when the sin actually takes place, guess who's not there? The serpent. Guess who's not there to tempt her anymore? See, the serpent didn't need to be there during the temptation or during the actual sin. You know why? Because the serpent already got her mind off of what God wanted, and she was too busy thinking about what she wanted. 
See, it says here, when the woman saw that the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eye des- and desirable for gaining wisdom. See, she wasn't thinking about what God wanted. She was so focused on this tree and this fruit and the possibilities and the opportunity for sinning or not even the opportunity for sinning. She was focusing on the, the, the benefits of disobedience that she forgot what God said. She forgot. She was not worried about what God wanted. She was too focused on what she wanted. It was pleasing to the eye, good for food. And she used her imagination. And also, you know, good for wisdom. She was justifying this. Have you ever found yourself doing that in life? Where you stop focusing on what God wants and you start justifying the things that you want? See, the reason why there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil is because anybody who determines What good and evil is gets to be God. And if you are here today and you want to determine what good, what's good and evil in your life, what's good and bad, what's true and false for you, well, then you're God of your life. And God's not the God of your life. Does that make sense? See, the reason why there needed to be a tree of knowledge of good and evil because it separated the creation from the creator. See, God made his people in his image to partner alongside him while taking care of this garden. But they were not willing to submit to his definition of good and evil. They wanted to define good and evil on their own. So they took an eight. Verse seven. What happened after they ate? Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking through the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But... The Lord God called to the man, where are you? Where are you? Do you notice that God doesn't come running after them? He doesn't come running after them, scolding them, yelling at them. He was just doing what he normally does. God was walking through the garden in the cool of the day, and he simply says, where are you? are you and he doesn't say that to condemn the couple no he says that to draw them out and let me tell you something if you are dissatisfied with your relationship with God and you're feeling some distance guess what God didn't leave you did you did if you're feeling distance between you and your relationship with God guess what God's not the one who moved We did. So the question is, where did the garden go? Rather, the better question is, where did we go? And God is standing there in the middle of the garden asking, where are you, Adam? Where are you, Eve? We normally walk this walk together, but you're not here. Where are you? See, sin separates And Satan will always get you focused off of what God wants and onto what you want. And he will overestimate the benefits of disobedience while completely neglecting the benefits of obedience. And you will be left alone. Separated from people. Separated from God. So where did the garden go? We kicked God out of our hearts. We are the ones who ran away from God. And he is the one standing in the garden saying, where are you? As a result, we couldn't stay there any longer. We started to die. Not right away. We clearly mentally started to die because how stupid is it to hide from an omnipresent God? 
I mean, literally, <laughs> it's so funny. You know, I was going to make a, make a pun right here. Oh, verse 10. Right? When God said, where are you? Verse 10. He, as in Adam, he said, I heard you in the garden. So I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Can somebody say, sin makes you stupid? Right? Turn to the person next to you and say, sin makes you stupid. Right? At that moment, he started to mentally depreciate. Adam's, like, level of intelligence is starting to quickly wane. Verse 11. That's, that was all I got to say for that. And he said, oh, God said this. Who to- wait, 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 wait. Who told you you were na- who told you that you were naked? Verse eleven. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, "Yes, I did." Leave Eve out of this. I take full responsibility. And the reason why you're not laughing is because you don't read your Bible. All right. No, this is what actually happened. He says, the woman that you put here with me, she's the one who gave me some fruit from the tree, and and I ate it. So essentially, he's blaming God and this woman. So he's saying, Adam is so, like, seriously, his, like, intelligence level. I mean, I had respect. Now there's nothing. All right. Literally, he's saying, God, like, you know what? It's not my fault. It's her fault. If you wouldn't have made her, we wouldn't be in this mess. How about you handle this with her? And then when you guys come to an agreement, you can come back and apologize to me. And if I feel like it, I will uh, accept your apology, God. Right? That's what Adam is doing. Remember where he was the whole time. So dumb. Sin makes you stupid. I want to make a shirt that says that. So the woman said, so, so, so basically, uh, who told you you were naked? He said, the woman, you know, the woman you put here with me, you know, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then verse 13, the Lord God said to the woman, um, what is this you've done? The woman said, uh, the serpent, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. Now you see this, good. You see the man, you see the woman, and then you see the serpent all playing this game. You know what the game is called? The blame game, right? The blame game makes you lame because that's how you spell blame because you are being lame when you be lame, blame, right? It's the blame game. It's the worst thing ever you can ever do, even in life. Now, here's a life lesson that you can learn from their stupidity, right? You can never blame your way into a better situation. Nobody has ever blamed their way into a promotion. Nobody has ever blamed their way into a better relationship. Nobody has ever blamed their way into a better tomorrow. Right? In order to have peace in your future, you need to own your peace of the past. Right? So even if it's a little bit, even if you're responsible for a little bit of that conflict or a little bit of that misbehavior or a little bit of that, you know, underproductivity, It's way better to own it. Somebody say own it. Because you cannot blame your way into a better tomorrow, and it didn't work for them, and it's not going to work for me, and it doesn't work for us. You can say amen. That's pretty good. Verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock, all the wild animals, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat the dust for the, all the days of your life. Which means that's not a snake because snakes don't eat dust. All right, verse 15. And I will put enmity. What's that mean? Um, division, fight, you know, one will be Ken and one will be Ryu. Um, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Right, so basically, somebody say cursed, crawl, crush. Cursed, crawl, crush. That's what's going to happen to the serp- serpent. That, that's what will happen to Satan. That's what will happen to the enemy in your life. Cursed is he. 
he will crawl. That is a symbol of his, you know, subjugation to the authority that you have in Christ. And Jesus will crush his head and he will strike his heel. This is a first, this is the first good news of the Bible. This is the first redemptive statement in the Bible. I'm going to teach you a theology word right now. It's worth $700 a unit, so you might want to write this down. Somebody say proto-evangelium. Doesn't that just feel good? It means first good news, right? Evangelium. So proto-evangelium. So this is the first good news. Proto-evangelium, right? This is a first foreknowledge. This is the first prophecy of Jesus in the Bible. Crushing the head of the serpent. Because now death has been entered into the world, but Jesus will destroy death. Which means if you are in Christ, you don't die, you just graduate. Does that make sense? But we don't follow Christ for the goodies because we're not gold diggers. We were made to have a love relationship with the God of the universe. And your heart will be dissatisfied with any other relationship outside of that. So the Lord God banished him from the garden to work the ground. So that's how we lost our home. That's how we lost our home because we kicked God out of our lives, therefore we were kicked out of the garden. We left God in the garden, and he stands there saying, where are you? It's funny because when bad things happen in the world, we are aware of our dissatisfaction of living on this planet, so instead of running to God, we end up hiding, and then we start saying, God, where are you? It's pride. God's the one calling us back. We're the one that kicked God out of our life. We're the ones that want to be the definers of good and evil in our lives. So the last question, which I think is the most important question in this series, is how do we get back home? How? How do we get back home? Romans 5.19 says it so clearly. Paul, if you're a skeptic or you don't even like Christians, then you're going to love Paul because he used to hate Christians. He used to kill them. And he had a come to Jesus moment that was so real, that changed his life. And he ended up writing 80% of the New Testament from jail. And he, was, he ended up being killed for his faith. And this is what he wrote about how do we get back home from a paradise that was lost, that we were meant to be in. For just as though disobedience, sorry, just as through the disobedience of the one man, who's the one man who disobeyed? Adam. Thank you guys for tracking with me. You guys are killing it. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners. We were made sinners. So also through the obedience of, Of the one man who obeyed? (laughs) Yeah, you guys are crushing it. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The many will be made righteous. Now, it's really uh, really important that you understand this theological principle. It's called the federal headship principle. Federal headship, headship principle. Um, I have to teach you these words because I went to school for a long time, so please forgive me. All right. Right. You know how, like, the president of the United States, if they, like, went to war with Russia, guess who else would be at war with Russia? Us. We would be at war with Russia. If the president went to war with another country, we would be enemies of that country. Right? That's called the federal headship principle. Now... We're talking, that was just an, an, an example of a country doing that. Now, imagine the whole world. Who used to be the representative for all of humanity in the world? Adam. Oh, somebody said Adam. Good job. Right. So Adam 
was the president of the U U earth, right? <laughs> he was the president of humanity, right, of the human species, right? And when he kicked God out of his heart, he ended up on the wrong team. As a result, all of y'all born on the wrong team, right? And you don't stand up against God. Like, that's just not going to happen. You're going to lose. So, but God loved you too much to leave you there. So in this verse, I love that this verse literally sums up the whole entire gospel. I love it. Paul's so smart. So through disobedience, all of us were made disobedient, right? Whether, whether you intentionally tried to do it or unintentionally tried to do it, right? Whether you knew that you were disobedient or you didn't know you were disobedient, whether you don't think you're disobedient or not, right? Because you're not the author of, tr of good and evil. Maybe in your life, but the reality is there's one author of good and evil. But whether you accept that or not, it's up to you. But that doesn't change how, how, how the rules of engagement work, right? Whether or not you think our president is your president, if you live here, he's your president, right? Whether or not you accept that Adam is the federal headship of humanity, doesn't change the rules of engagement. He still is the representative of humanity, and as a result, we were all made disobedient. But God, in his great entire love, standing at the gates of the garden, saying, where are you? Sent his son, Jesus, to come and get you, but not against your will. Not against your will. Because it's through the obedience of the one man that many are going to be made righteous. See, you get to choose a new president. You get to choose a new leader of your life. And it can't be you. There's only room for one leader at a time. So if you come under the federal headship of Jesus Christ, you will be made righteous. And you can experience what you were meant to experience in the garden, which is a loving relationship that lasts, beauty that never fails, and work that is meaningful. Jesus now becomes the way back home. I'm going to invite the band to come back up. The three questions that we, we ask today is, where is home? The answer is, the garden is where we were meant to be with God forever. You were not meant to experience death. That's why it feels so unnatural. The second question we ask is, where did home go? And the answer is, we ran away. And the third question is, how do we get back? Jesus shows us the way back home. Jesus shows us the way back home if we will come under his leadership. There's two action steps that I want you to do. Did you know you can visit home through prayer? You can visit home through prayer because Jesus is our home. And you can renovate your home through action. See, the Bible says, don't store, uh, the Bible says to store up for yourself treasures in heaven. You know how you store up for yourself treasures in heaven? By investing in the things that God loves. By investing in the things that God thinks is valuable. And you know who God thinks is valuable? People. And when you love and invest your time into people, you are renovating your home. And it's through prayer you get to visit your home. And Jesus is that. See, the garden is subscript. The garden is, is number two. It's just the environment in which you were meant to foster a loving relationship with God. But when you come to God in prayer, complete, authentic, intimate, real prayer, when you say, you know what, I don't want to be the author of good and evil. I don't want to be focusing on what I want. I want to focus on what you want. And you do that one-on-one, -on -one, alone, you get to experience what home is like. You get to visit home. 
can renovate your home by actually acting on the things that you learn from your time with God. So this week, maybe this year, you may not be the praying type, but if you are if you are in Christ, I want you to pray. I want you to spend time alone praying. Setting aside your will. Set aside your thoughts of what good and evil is and asking God, teach me, show me what good and evil is. Whatever is good, whatever is pleasing, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, help me to think about those things. And may I define myself based on your words, not on mine. Protect me from evil. That's what I want to challenge you with this year. In this series, we're, we're going to pray and visit home. And we're going to act and renovate that home. Another word for that is called listen and follow. Would you do that with me this night? Would you do that with me this 2019? Let's stand and pray. Father, Father, I surrender the control of my life to you. I surrender the control of my life to you. I don't want to lead my life. I humbly surrender the leadership of my life to Jesus. Show me the way in which I should go. May your will be done and your kingdom come. Thank you for this opportunity to learn freely. And I freely accept the seed, the word of truth that is planted into my heart. And I ask that you would make it grow. Lord, may I experience intimacy with you, both now and forever, without fear. I give you my life. I give you my today. I give you my tomorrow. In Jesus' name we all said, amen.